choristers starts the scene. And the processional choir moves off the bride's procession behind. And for one moment, we see the bride now as she looks about her at the abbey. In this lovely gown, a white silk organza. With a glittering diadem on her head. The orchids in her hand the comforting, tall, friendly and alert figure of the Duke of Edinburgh, on whose right arm she can rely. The voice of Richard Dimbleby at Princess Margaret's wedding in Westminster Abbey in 1960. The voice which millions of listeners and viewers throughout the English-speaking world so often felt to be their personal guide to the great ceremonial occasions of our recent past. Over the course of 30 years, in fact, this voice was to become the voice of authority, of knowledge, of warm sympathy and understanding too, which was to interpret for us, for each one of us personally, it seemed, the splendours of our state occasions, the significance of our ceremonies, indeed, in war and peace, the full measure of our recent history best remembered, though, for this. All the majesty and colour of a royal day in a proper setting. Every name correct, every detail exact, every word seems in the right place. And so, through the organ screen, comes the great cross of Westminster. Behind it, the clergy. In this, you'll find... Minor canons and the canons of Westminster, and then the Dean's Cross, borne by the sacrist. And behind the bridesmaids, first on the left, Lady Virginia Fitzroy, who's six, the Queen's goddaughter. And on the right there, that's little Catherine Vesey, the niece of the bridegroom. She's six. And behind to the left. Sarah Lowther, another goddaughter of the Queen. They're all wearing the same organza, and they look really charming with their poses of flowers and those very solemn little faces. And at the back, on the right, Her Royal Highness Princess Anne, nine years old on her left, Miss Marilyn Wills, her great friend, the goddaughter of the bride. And the bride herself, coming now towards the end of this long journey, with all the solemnity of the clergy leading her, the eyes of a thousand people on her. The occasion, like all the occasions Richard Dimbleby described, means something to us. Of course, excellence of this order doesn't come overnight. To reach such mastery in his craft, Richard served a long apprenticeship. Born into journalism, yes, but into newspapers. His father ran the Richmond and Twickenham Times, and Richard trained as a newspaper reporter. It was in 1936 that, as a young man, he wrote to the BBC, saying that while the corporation's news bulletins were world-renowned for their probity, they were extremely dull. What was needed, he told them, was someone like himself, an observer who would go out and see things actually happening, and then describe them with colour and zeal. He got the job, and so dawned his first day as a broadcaster. I was sent out... Uh... If I remember rightly, I was sent out on the first broadcasting job I did, which may not quite have been my first day, but very nearly was, to record, of all things, a champion cow. Um, this is quite a serious story. There was a cow by the name of Cherry, which lived in a, on a farm or in a stable at a village, a small town called Amesbury, on the middle of Salisbury Plain. And this cow, that year, had given a bigger yield of milk in the course of the year than any other cow in the world. And this was considered to be quite an important record, and I was told to go down and record, they said, an interview with the cow. <laughs> well, in those days I was willing to tackle anything, I wouldn't be so keen on doing it now. We went down to Amesbury, the cow was very obliging, because we held a microphone up and I said, what do you think about this wonderful yield of milk you've produced this year. I don't know whether the farmer gave it a little smack on the back or something, but the extraordinary thing was the cow let out a wonderful moo at this very moment, <laughs> which sounded exactly like an answer. Within a short time, he was plunged into the world arena, which in those days of rapidly expanding communications was already the newsman's field of operation. Almost at once, 
he was to see at first hand something of the misery and suffering of war, something which was to make a profound impression, and indeed deeply to influence his life and work. His reporting of the Spanish Civil War was to bring home, perhaps for the first time to many ordinary listeners in these islands, what war now meant to ordinary people just like ourselves. The suffering was no longer confined to a battlefield in some faraway country. Everyone is agitated. The headquarters of the prefect are like a beehive, day and night and Sunday included. I've had to wait a total of nearly nine hours for two special permits. I've shown them all together exactly 47 times. I've been asked if I carry arms six times and searched for them twice. And once, last night, someone mistook me for a refugee and tried to push me into a cattle truck. Perhaps that sounds vaguely amusing, but the whole refugee problem here is intensely serious and, and pathetic is the only word I can think of, unless perhaps tragic is better. There are thousands of them, mostly women and young children, coming over the three main entrances, Seber, Lepertus and Bourg-Madame. Some of them are in the last stages of exhaustion. They are hungry, starving, many of them, and numbed with cold. In spite of the work of relief organizations and the scheme of evacuation which the French authorities have put into operation quite successfully, many of them have died. An introduction to the war reporting which was to make Richard Dimbleby a household name in the years all too soon to follow. When the Second World War did break out, he was the first war correspondent in France, in the Middle East. He covered the campaigns in Egypt and Libya, in Greece and Syria, he trained the BBC's team of reporters to cover the Second Front, and when it came, he was to play a major part. He led the team of air observers, and was constantly flying with the RAF on bomber raids over Germany. There was, of course, no tape recording in those days, only ordinary records, and as the bomber twisted and turned to avoid the flak, the engineer would struggle to keep the needle in the cutting groove, while Richard wrestled with his microphone. Now we are coming in for the target. We're approaching Cleve. I've just heard the voice of the master bomber in my headphones ordering us to the extremely low height from which we're going to bomb. Not very welcome news, perhaps, for us. And we're on our way down to that... <coughs> we're on our way down to that height now. Our bombs are going. The flak is bursting just under us. Studying us. We're going over the top now. Flares and fire. I don't know how we can stand it. We're shaking with the flak. Crew, shaking and, and, and feel a break as they fire. How steady and calm the crew and the skipper are keeping on their course. Now we ought to be in the sun our bombs are, and they're bursting there now. Flash, 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 crash. I'm sorry, I tried to be, I tried to be contained and steady on this commentary, but it's more than I can do. It's a staggering sight that we can see in the sky. As the Allied advance struck deep into Germany itself, Richard found himself in an area, already engulfed in the fighting, watching the reactions of a German family in a country hotel, listening to the BBC News from London. And as I watched them, a thought struck me. This was a recital from London of our success, of the growing and spreading defeat of their country. And yet there was not one sound or sign of regret on their faces. No shock, no despair, no alarm. They just picked up what was said, checked it on the map, and noted it, just as if they were a bunch of neutrals hearing all about somebody else. And, and indeed I believe that that's what many of these frontline German people are, neutrals in their own country. They seem to have lost the power of passion or sorrow. They show no sympathy for their army, for their government, or for their country. To them, the war is something too huge and too catastrophic to understand. Their world is bounded by the difficulties of managing a country hotel. He was also to go on special assignments, and it was one of these, his visit to Belsen concentration camp in 1945, that many consider his most moving broadcast. Outside, it had been the lucky prisoners, the men and women who had only just arrived at Belsen before we captured it. But beyond the barrier was a whirling cloud of dust, the dust of thousands of slowly moving people, laden in itself with the deadly typhus germ. And with the dust was a smell sickly and thick, the smell of death and decay, of corruption and filth. I passed through the barrier and found myself 
in the world of a nightmare. Dead bodies, some of them in decay, lay strewn about the road and along the rutted tracks. On each side of the road were brown wooden huts. There were faces at the windows, the bony, emaciated faces of starving women too weak to come outside, propping themselves against the glass to see the daylight before they died. And they were dying every hour and every minute. I saw men wandering dazedly along the road, stagger and fall. Someone else looked down at him, took him by the heels, and dragged him to the side of the road to join the other bodies lying unburied there. No one else took the slightest notice. They didn't even trouble to turn their heads. Babies were born at Belson. Some of them shrunken, wizened little things that could not live because their mothers could not feed them. One woman, distraught to the point of madness, flung herself at a British soldier who was on guard in the camp on the night that it was reached by the 11th Armoured Division. She begged him to give her some milk for the tiny baby she held in her arms. She laid the mite on the ground, threw herself at the sentry's feet and kissed his boots. And when, in his distress, he asked her to get up, she put the baby in his arms and ran off, crying that she would find milk for it because there was no milk in her breast. And when the soldier opened the bundle of rags to look at the child, he found it had been dead for days. This experience shocked Richard profoundly. How could this thing happen in the 20th century, in a supposedly civilised country? This was to be a turning point. One thing the mass communications medium of broadcasting must do, he felt, was to uplift and strengthen the standards of a decent civilised social order. His feeling that our ceremonies of state were not just great traditions, but important to an ordered way of life, dates from this time. As Hitler's Germany crumbled into dust, it seemed fitting that Richard Dimbleby should be in a significant spot at the very end. This is Richard Dimbleby. I'm speaking to you while sitting in Hitler's chair at the remains of his desk in his study in the Reich Chancellery in Berlin. It was, in its time, a grand, almost overbearingly grand apartment, a huge, high chamber with brown marble walls on which great tapestries were hung. Those tapestries now have disappeared into the rubble and the chaos that lie along the marble floor, making it with the dust that lies powdered on it so slippery that you have to pick your way across. And he was there too with the thankful crowds in Whitehall to describe the excitement of VE Day. And now Mr. Churchill stands on the balcony of the Ministry of Health. He's wearing his boiler suit, the famous boiler suit that he's made so wonderful. And he had the audacity, shall I say, to put on his head his famous black hat. Nobody can say that it goes with a boiler suit, but you heard what a cheer it raised from the crowd. He stands now in the floodlights, the band playing for He's a Jolly Good Fellow, and he's giving the victory sign for all his might from the flooded balcony. I had no idea when I began speaking to you a moment ago that Mr. Churchill was coming out again. But there he is, standing, waving to the crowd with, with his naval ADC behind him and the people of the Ministry of Health crowded on each side of him, smiling. And now listen, the band is playing Land of Hope and Glory and the crowd is singing. And this suddenly has become a very moving moment for Mr. Churchill too is singing and he is conducting the singing of this song. Will you listen, please? So the war was over, and the broadcasters who'd been reporting events which had seemed to put them right in the centre of history had to adjust themselves, like everyone else, to the commonplaces of everyday life in peacetime. From 1945 onwards, Richard was to enlarge his experience, turning his hand to a whole new range of work, calling for wit and great versatility, an absence of script and a presence of mind. 
Well, that's what you hear, listeners. Um, can I tell you, if I can get the breath to tell you properly, that I'm very glad this isn't a television broadcast tonight, because this is the first time that I've ever spoken to you in my birthday suit. And I'm sorry to tell you, to be quite honest, that I'm not even wearing a towel. And I'm lying at the moment on a marble slab, looking like part of the morning delivery at the fish bunkers, with various other people who are lying here around me in this Turkish bath, just under the ground in German Street. Now, I'm lying on my tummy at the moment, which helps to make me sound a bit breathless, so I think I'll... Where is it up, please? Do I? There's the man telling me what to do. That, by the way, is, is George Stanning. You're going to hear from him in a moment. George has just finished me, uh, rubbing me down, as it were, and he's just given me a tattoo on the back, and another customer is lying on the slab next to me. And now, George, where do I go? Into the shower. Well, here I go into the shower. Will you hold the microphone? One second. Oh, lovely. That'll do for the shower, and now oh, for the plunge. Turn that go the plunge. This is where the <laughs> brave man takes a deep breath, and here I go. Ooh. It's cold, believe me, it's absolutely lovely. And as soon as I've said goodbye to you, listeners, I'm going back into that plunge again. <laughs> and there was literally no knowing where he'd find himself next. with the amusing, the sometimes faintly frivolous, was still his news reporting, and the continuing association with royal events, with the monarchy, which he felt to be so vital a cornerstone of that healthy society he so cherished. In 1947, the wedding of Princess Elizabeth and the young Lieutenant Philip Mountbatten. And when George VI died, a beloved king who had been with us through the most troubled years of our history... Richard Dimbleby was to describe the lying in state in Westminster Hall with such mastery of words as to bring home, perhaps for the first time to many listeners, loyal subjects, the full significance of that dignified and moving moment. It is very simple, this lying in state of a dead king and of incomparable beauty. High above, all light and shadow and rich in carving, is the massive roof of chestnut that Richard II put over the great hall. From that roof, the light slants down in clear, straight beams, unclouded by any dust, and gathers in a pool at one place. There lies the coffin of the king. The oak of Sandringham, hidden beneath the rich, golden folds of the standard. The slow flicker of the candles touches gently the gems of the imperial crown. Even that ruby that King Henry wore at Agincourt. It touches the deep purple of the velvet cushion and the cool white flowers of the only wreath that lies upon the flag. How moving can such simplicity be? How real the tears of those who pass and see it, and come out again, as they do at this moment in unbroken stream, to the cold, dark night, and a little privacy for their thoughts. He would be forgiven, who believed that these yeomen of the bodyguard, facing outwards from the corners of the catafalque, were carven statues of the yeomen of the Tudor Henry's day. Could any living man let alone a white-bearded man of eighty, be frozen into this immobility. The faces of the two gentlemen-at-arms are hidden by the long white helmet plumes that have fallen about them like a curtain as they bowed their heads. 
Are they real, those faces? Or do the plumes conceal two images of stone? And the slim, straight figures of the officers of the household brigade, hands poised lightly on their arms reversed. What sense of pride and honor holds their sword so still that not one gleam of light shall be reflected from a trembling blade? Never safer, better guarded, lay a sleeping king than this. Of all his broadcasts, this was one of his favorites. But it wasn't long before we were looking eagerly ahead to the crowning of a young queen. Richard was now making his mark in that other branch of broadcasting, the glossy, growing medium of television, striding out, finding its feet and its audience. By 1953, Richard was already the chief interpreter of our national occasions, the master of our ceremonies, and his coverage of the glittering coronation in the Abbey that year not only made millions sit up and take notice in a big way of the small screen, but won for Richard world acclaim. He knew every single move in the ceremony. It was this that gave people such confidence in him. He seemed to know all the details. Her Majesty returns the orb, and the Archbishop now places upon the fourth finger of her right hand the ring, the ring wherein is set a sapphire, and on it a ruby cross. This is often called the wedding ring of England. Receive the ring of kingly dignity and the seal of Catholic faith. And as thou art this day consecrated to be our head and prince, so may you continue steadfastly as the defender of Christ's religion, that being rich in faith, and blessed in all good works, you may reign with him who is the King of Kings, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, the Dean of Westminster brings to the Archbishop the scepter with the cross and the rod with the dove, while the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster offers to the Queen the traditional glove of white kid, lined with silk, embroidered with thistles, shamrocks, and English oak leaves and acorns. Receive the royal scepter, the ensign of kingly power and justice. Receive the rod of equity, Richard Dimbleby in his element, putting us right there in the picture. As well as the direct commentary, the straight report, he had, of course, developed his mastery of the broadcast interview. Here was not only a polished technique, but an obvious gift of warmth and sincerity with people. It wasn't just a job of work for him. He really seemed genuinely interested. During the five years he travelled the length and breadth of Britain with the radio programme Down Your Way, he met thousands of very ordinary people with no special claim to fame, yet always, each time, the one person he was interviewing seemed to count in a very special way. I'd like to know, in the time that you've been a midwife, which is how many years, roughly? About 35. How many children have you delivered? 2,374. A wonderful total. <laughs> when you say 2,374, you rather emphasise that four. When was that? Well, the last baby of all was born this morning. Mm -hmm. What time? <laughs> at about 6 o'clock. I was out at 3.30, oh. and the baby was born about 6 o'clock. Well, I morning. hope as soon as we finish our interview, you'll go and make up your lost sleep, will you? Maybe. What did the baby weigh? Eight pounds. Good one? Very nice baby indeed. What, a boy? Boy, yes. Good, good, well, good luck to him. <laughs> Later on, when the searching interview became the thing, with the television camera joined in battle with the probing question, Richard was still able to cut right through the verbiage of the political pundits, and with a simplicity seemingly denied his eager colleagues, strike right at the heart of the matter. When President Kennedy ordered the Russian missiles out of Cuba and the world stood on the brink of nuclear war, Richard questioned a leading defence correspondent. Well, now, this brings me to, to, to a question I very much wanted to put to you before this program ended. I am aware, a lot of people must be, I think, that a great many people today are extremely worried and perhaps a lot are very frightened by what has happened and have some 
awful feeling that something dreadful may happen quite quickly, suddenly. Do you think there is any reason at all for short-term immediate nerves on this? While that programme was on the air, a woman rang the studios to say she would send her children to school in the morning only if Richard Dimbleby said it was safe to do so. He felt his public responsibility very deeply. And I don't think that we can usefully tonight take you any further in this. May I just say, as I have said on emergency programmes like this before, I hope we have been of some real service to you this evening. Good night. Commentator and interviewer par excellence, what was his secret? For commentary, he always claimed the vital thing was days and often weeks or months even of careful preparation. Doing your homework, he called it. Interviewing, he once talked about this to the audience of an overseas radio program called Asian Club. I suppose the most important thing for someone who is spending his time asking questions of other people is that he should be genuinely interested in other people. You can't really, I think, be a good interviewer if you're bored by what the other person is saying, if you don't want to know what they want to tell you, and if you're just asking questions for the sake of asking questions. I hope that you're not asking questions now for the sake of asking questions. <laughs> but um, given that you are interested in what a person has to say, the second thing is I think that you must be good at listening. It's easy for me tonight because you haven't got any choice. But uh, one, of the, one, of the, um, one of the talents that I have, and it's rather a precious one to me, is that I am able to listen to other people, even when they are bores, for a long, long time without ever showing that I'm not deeply interested in what they're saying. I'm not talking about broadcasting now, I'm talking about an ordinary life. My wife always says that I'm the best listener she's ever come across in her life. <laughs> if you... If you spend your time and are paid to talk and talk and talk and talk as I'm talking now, she doesn't know what a blessed relief it is sometimes to sit down and let somebody else do all the talking and you just listen to them. <laughs> but you must, be, um, you must be interested in people. You must want to know or want to get out of them the information you're trying to get. And you must be, I think, good at listening to people. I don't like the sort of interviewing which is growing very widely where the interviewer I think is impertinent and asks cruel questions deliberately to try and get the other person into a difficult position and I, unless of course the person is interviewing a villain and everybody knows he's interviewing a villain that's all right <laughs> and, um, and I don't like the fashion which is now spreading for the interviewer to become as important as the person who's being interviewed there's a growing tendency now for people to become very famous, and this is not just Great Britain, this applies very much in America, for example, very famous because they are famous interviewers. Now, they shouldn't be famous interviewers. When we started the business of interviewing in broadcasting and in television, I think we should all have been anonymous, and we should have stayed anonymous all the way through, so that nobody knew us at all except as the man who asks the questions, because the whole object of the exercise of an interview is to hear what the person being interviewed has got to say. Nobody wants to know what the interviewer is saying. Who cares about him? Nowadays, it's got so turned round the wrong way that it's considered a great honour by somebody to be interviewed by Mr X. War reporting, commentating, interviewing. Whatever the job in broadcasting, Richard had done it. In 1955, he appeared in another role, as anchor man in a television programme which set out to cover the world, Panorama. It was he to whom millions turned each week for information and comment in crisis and catastrophe and for the totally unexpected. As a matter of fact, I swallowed one of these about two hours ago. And the explanation is that it is in fact this size. You can just see it on the palm of my hand. It's a tiny radio transmitter about twice the size of an average medicine pill. The purpose of it is to enable people to carry out telemetry. The first international conference on the subject of telemetry uh, began in this country today. This merely means transmitting measurements or readings remotely by radio. Could be space, could be from inside somebody's tummy, as the transmitter which is in my tummy now. Well, now, let's first of all show, prove, shall we, if I put that transmitter down a moment, that the one which is inside me somewhere is now transmitting. This is the aerial. I'll hold it near myself. Now... Uh, 
that is the interior of Dimbleby transmitting. It's sending a signal saying what pressures it's finding inside me. Um, I can perhaps demonstrate this. If I shake myself or bang myself, you'll hear what happens to the signal. Quite famous. That's transmitting information which doctors one day will be able to interpret in detail. Now, if I put down the aerial a moment and proceed to swallow this second transmitter, I trust I shall be able to do it without too much difficulty. That transmitter is, I now have two inside me, is to show the temperature inside my body. Mr. Wolf? Yes, you Now, the drop in the signal, this is, this is genuine, I'm not fiddling this. The drop in the signal, or the rise in the signal, shows the change in temperature as the thing heats up inside me. Panorama was a huge success. Kings, ministers of state, scientists, industrialists, leading men and women in every walk of life passed before its cameras. There was a suggestion that Richard Dimbleby was becoming an influence out of all proportion. A threatened rail strike showed this in an unexpected way. The confrontation between Transport Minister Ernest Marples and the railwayman Sidney Green resulted in Richard being accused of acting Minister of Transport. It's a bit of a novel method of trying to, co uh, to start negotiations in connection with the strike by a minister doing it over television. Mr Green, could I intervene a moment, not to be a mediator, because that certainly is not my role, but to try and clarify this unexpected point that we've come to. Um, as I understand it, Minister, do you mean that you would be prepared to tell Dr Beeching, which I presume you can do, or advise Dr Beeching, that he should meet Mr. Green, if necessary, tomorrow and try very hard to come to a real arrangement on the subject of what consultation means. Well, all I can do is to say that what Dr. Beeching has said himself, not what I ask him to do. No, but you may he, not... He, he has think... said that at any time the unions come and wish to discuss and clarify consultation procedure, we will be willing to do so. But there has... All I say to Mr. Green is this. Dr. Beaton's made that offer, and I well, think I, in the interest of the public, I that quickly it. accept I that offer. I don't know where he made uh, the uh, offer. Uh, he hasn't made it to me. Well, it's on the tape. Well, I, that's a new way of doing well, it. Well, it if is I, on the tape, isn't it? I didn't communicate my decision to go on strike through television or on in the station. Well, well look, we must are not please. all matters in connection with it. There are a great many people listening at the moment who are going to be very seriously inconvenienced on Wednesday, and I don't doubt have very strong feelings on this subject, one way or the other. The Duke of Edinburgh had introduced the National Geophysical Year on television and had reported on his travels for a children's programme. But the first time he, or any other member of the Queen's immediate family, decided to allow himself to be questioned on a regular current affairs programme, it was to be at the hands of Richard Dimbleby. Reverting for a moment to the subject of, of the training week, what, what is the scope of it? How much has been organised for this week? Well, it's uh, it's been taken up in every Commonwealth country, both the self-governing um, countries as well as the colonial territories, except the very small ones who found it a bit difficult to do anything particular. And in this country alone, I think uh, there are something like uh, 10,000 major occasions have been, stunts have been organized. When I say major occasions, it's involving at least about 500 people. So that uh, there's a considerable interest in this country. And I think, I hope that it'll be the same in, in others. That's five million people on that calculation who are concerned with it in some way. Uh, well, your mathematics are better than mine. <laughs> I did it beforehand. <laughs> <laughs> with Dimbleby in the chair, or at the microphone, or in front of the cameras, everything, it seemed, was all right. Sometimes, in fact, it was not. And it was on these occasions that his worth as a true professional was beyond measure to the Harris producer in a tight spot. With Dimbleby out in front, he could relax. Again and again, the master came to the rescue. Like the time he filled in for three quarters of an hour before Princess Margaret left for her honeymoon, or the moment during a state visit to France, when the Queen was leaving the Paris Opera. It was a very great occasion. They had the, the, the uh, guard republicaine with all their lovely uniforms on the stairs and searchlights outside. Something like 150,000 people outside the Opera House. I was in a box inside... Uh, where I'd been for the performance and had to commentate on her departure from the front of the opera without seeing myself what was going on. I could see, of course, what the television cameras outside were showing me on a television set inside this box. So watching that, I was able to describe the thing. That was the idea. Just before we went on... In fact, ten seconds before we went on the air, 
the lights failed in the opera house. And not only was I plunged into pitch darkness, but the monitor was switched off automatically and the picture went dead. The lights all went out and I was in this little box with curtains across the front so dark that I literally couldn't see my hand if I held it up like this. Unable to see anything that was happening outside, but on the air, and since my telephone had broken down, no means of telling the producer that I couldn't see. So I had to listen to the cheers outside and guess what was going on and say, well, now, you know, the procession and with the sweat pouring down my face. And after about, after about ten minutes of this, the producer realised that I couldn't see and began telling me in my headphones what he could see through his cameras and we managed to get it right. And I think people never really listened to television because nobody wrote in to say, you know, what happened, what went wrong. It was very disappointing. I wish somebody noticed that we made a mess of it. <laughs> Always the unexpected. He could never be sure what would happen next. The tragedy of President Kennedy's assassination in 1963 took Richard Dimbleby to the United States and to an event for which there could be none of the usual careful preparation. His commentary accompanied pictures of the funeral transmitted by satellite. And so outside to the sunshine, where the bearer party, some of them coloured servicemen, drawn from all the services, proudly, reverently and carefully, bear their dead president and commander-in-chief down the steep steps, back to the gun carriage which waits for them at the bottom. Cardinal Cushing sprinkles holy water on the coffin and kisses it. Somewhere high above, a single bell is tolling. And the slow, careful party moves on to the gun carriage. Mrs. Kennedy, the children, the other mourners follow down the steps behind. The presidential flag, the American eagle between the arrow of war and the dove of peace, but facing the dove of peace, is borne away to take its place in the procession for the journey to begin to the National Cemetery at Arlington. Always mindful of the significance of what he was describing and being a sensitive man, inevitably he could not remain detached from events as he saw them. His work often brought him into contact with grief and suffering, and he could not stand idly by. When the earthquake struck Skopje in Yugoslavia, the rapport between Richard and the public enabled him to collect £402,000 in a television appeal. And it was the same with the Persian earthquake, when the response to his appeal on that occasion was the largest in the history of television, £407,000. Most of us don't know much about earthquakes, we don't realise what they can mean. If you just look for a moment at this picture, a picture which shows a woman and her children going past the ruins of a house, you'll realise how suddenly life can come to a standstill for these poor people when something like a really violent earthquake happens. The need is enormous and the need is terribly urgent. It's got to be something in the next 48 hours to be really effective. And may I add one thing? You will have guessed by now that this is not tonight an appeal which has been carefully prepared for weeks and weeks. This is something we have thrown together in an emergency when we realised how desperate the emergency was. People are living in circumstances of horror. I believe that you will want to help. This is the quickest, best and most effective way to do it. I never ask for anything more seriously than I am asking for this at this moment. Altogether, Richard Dimbleby's broadcast appeals raised nearly a million pounds for charity. As the all-round television professional, another challenge he certainly enjoyed was the minute-by-minute -minute coverage of the general election results. These were marathon occasions, 36 hours in the studio with only one hour off for recuperation. And we were not to know then in what pain he often was, a burden he bore with Roman courage. And his list of firsts in broadcasting history was truly remarkable. The first live pictures from the other side of the channel. The first May Day parade in Moscow's Red Square to be seen in Britain. He was the first to televise live across the Atlantic via Telstar. And eventually, when Early Bird made continuous transmission from America possible, Panorama itself went to the New World. Good afternoon and welcome to New York, live by Early Bird satellite, the first BBC programme to come to you this way. 
I should have said good evening. 8.25 with you, Richard Dimbleby here. 3.25 on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, which is across between Dante's Inferno and Piccadilly Circus. You'll observe as you look in this big room here that the Union Jack and the American banner are flying side by side. The Union Jack has been put up in honor of Panorama's visit, I'm glad to say. And you'll also observe as you look down the better part of 2,000 people in a seething, roaring, shouting mass. You'd think there was some kind of a panic on. It's nothing of the kind. It's the last five minutes of a normal day's trading. And I'm right plumb in the middle of it, holding on to this elaborate apparatus so that I can talk to you across the ocean. Up on the wall there, you'll see a huge thing like a cricket scoreboard, which is where they tell the brokers that they're wanted on the telephone as the numbers come down on flaps. On the left of that, there's a huge ticker tape, which is giving the late prices. The New York brokers, there are 800 of them working on the floor here, are all busy trying to get into the picture and very curious to know what we're doing. As well as the ticker tapes, you have what are called command posts. Each of these wooden booths around on the floor here is called a command post, and they deal the specialists who sell the shares. They don't have jobbers here like we do in London. The brokers themselves do the dealing. All prices are out in the open. They're all shouted out loud, and that's why there's such an extraordinary racket when you try and talk in this place at all. Back at home, when the television cameras were allowed one of their rare visits to the House of Lords for the state opening of Parliament, Richard was there in the chamber, our guide to this royal visit. And the Queen passes alone the imperial state crown upon her head. Her traditional and historic parliamentary robe hanging from her shoulders and held by four pages. Her long white lace dress embroidered all over with iridescent beads that gleam and spangle and shine. And about her shoulders and at her throat the collar of the Order of the Garter. Before her the heralds, Black Rod, Garter, King of Arms. Immediately before her, carrying out their proud and difficult duty, the Earl Marshal on the left, on the right, the Lord Great Chamberlain. On the Queen's left, Lord Fraser with a sword of state. On her right, Lord Longford with the cap of maintenance, which, as you can see as you look at Her Majesty, is in fact the lining to a crown. And the four young pages, carefully carrying the parliamentary robe as she passes. Let us now move through the archway and to the throne of the lords where all are in position. The head of the procession makes its backward way round the steps of the throne. All is still and silent. Every eye turned upon Her Majesty. And her crown glimmers and gleams even brighter than Pugin's gold decorations set on the old oak wood for which they stripped the oak warships of old to provide the lining for this chamber. The Queen goes to her throne and she will call upon everyone to be seated. And the next part of the ceremony will follow. For us in the business, it seemed the master could do no wrong. But there were those for whom Richard Dimbleby could do no right. His long association with our national days of ceremony led to the assumption that he was pompous, vain, a lackey of the establishment, too big for his boots by half. Richard talked about some of these charges with the journalist William Hardcastle. I don't in the least mind criticism which is criticism of the way in which I perform on television. Any more than if you're a writer, you can object to people criticising the way you write or saying they don't like your books. I mean, this is, you know, you're there to be shot at if you do anything like this. What I don't like and what does, doesn't exactly hurt my feelings, but it annoys me, is when somebody attributes to you some tray or some characteristic that you quite sincerely do not believe you have, if it's something unpleasant, and ascribes to it a reason or gives for it a reason which is totally false. If I may give you an example of what I mean, um, I've been accused time and time again of talking on royal occasions in a reverent and hushed voice. As though I were doing this because the Queen was in the room and I felt it wasn't nice to talk out loud in front of the Queen. 
Of course, the reason isn't this at all. The reason is that if you have a microphone in your hand, you will know this is a broadcaster, and you're standing in a silent room where some frightfully dignified ceremony is going on, I challenge you right. to stand in the corner right. and talk in a normal, brisk, loud voice. One thing you would certainly do is bring the ceremony to a standstill. Now, this is purely right. technical necessity, nothing else at all. Now, on these subjects where you think wrong attitudes have been attributed to, would one of them be... Uh, your attitude to royalty, your, what some people have said, your allegedly sycophantic attitude, your <laughs> forelock-touching attitude yes, to royalty. Yes, I know. Is this just one of the things it's that... Absolute, that? It's absolute bunk. It really is. I mean, I can only tell you from my own... my own... Uh, well, what can I say? My own personal experience in this field. I, naturally enough, I've been doing all the major royal things for damn near a quarter of a century now. And I've talked to the Queen on many occasions, privately, and to Prince Philip and other members of the royal family, inevitably, because one gets caught up in sort of organisation. And believe you me, I, uh, I have no feelings of that sort. Am I a monarchist? Yes. Am I a loyal supporter of the throne? Yes. Do I go round on my hands and knees? No. <laughs> That's a simple answer to that. <laughs> Sycophantic, pompous... Well, those of us who knew Richard Dimbleby at home as a friend found it impossible to understand how such words could ever be associated with a man with whom we would sing as he improvised brilliantly at the piano, who had the perfect setting of a happy family life, and who hankered after his farm or his house in the country during all his involvement with ceremonial splendours. And he had wit, wit in his own right, when Panorama filmed the famous hoax of a spaghetti harvest, it was Richard who added the polish that made it one of the best April the 1st leg pulls the BBC ever perpetrated on its viewers. It isn't only in Britain that spring this year has taken everyone by surprise. Here, in the Ticino, on the borders of Switzerland and Italy, the slopes overlooking Lake Lugano have already burst into flower, at least a fortnight earlier than usual. But what, you may ask, has the early and welcome arrival of bees and blossom to do with food? Well, it's simply that the past winter, one of the mildest in living memory, has had its effect in other ways as well. Most important of all, it's resulted in an exceptionally heavy spaghetti crop. The last two weeks of March, are an anxious time for the spaghetti farmer. There's always the chance of a late frost, which, while not entirely ruining the crop, generally impairs the flavour and makes it difficult. These dangers are over and the spaghetti harvest goes forward. Spaghetti cultivation here in Switzerland is not, of course, carried out on anything like the tremendous scale of the Italian industry. Many of you, I'm sure, will have seen pictures of the vast spaghetti plantations in the Po Valley. For the Swiss, however, it tends to be more of a family affair. Another reason why this may be a bumper year lies in the virtual disappearance of the spaghetti weevil, the tiny creature whose depredations have caused much concern in the past. Though television took up more and more of his broadcasting time, he never entirely forsook radio. For 18 years, he was one of the panellists on 20 Questions. Finally, though, as we think of Richard Dimbleby... It is surely always to the great occasions in our national life that we return. Somehow it seemed right and fitting that one of the last great occasions when he spoke to us, the last of his great broadcasts, should also be the last journey of Sir Winston Churchill in the launch Havengore, upstream through the heart of London. How slowly they seem to creep away upstream towards the bridges of London. Haven Gore flying the flag of the Lord Warden of the Sink Ports. The Trinity Houseboat remembering that Winston Churchill was an elder brother. And there behind London on this day of mourning. And the only movement on this bustling, thriving waterway of ours, this small flotilla. It seems almost to be drifting up the last of the tide at high water on its way to Waterloo. High in the background, one of those vast new towers that decorate London. St. Paul's on the right hand. The cranes and wharves of Billingsgate and Queen Hythe. And one more salute to be added here, the salute of the Royal Air Force, 
the lightnings of fighter command dipping over the river. So all the services now have saluted the great man as he goes. We watch from deep underneath London Bridge. As the launches slowly come through, you see the top of the tide, how high it is, how small the bridge arch seems to be. On its way, again, upriver. The voice of Richard Dimbleby broadcaster and friend, a gifted man certainly, a good man too, a kind man, indeed to us in broadcasting, a great man. <laughs>